And Paula Reed joins me now from the White House. Hi, Paula. So let's start with the coronavirus. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says his chamber will take up a targeted COVID-19 bill this week. What will the bill focus on? And does the White House support more funding? Well, Tanya, in speaking with my sources here at the White House, it appears that Friday's better than expected jobs report really does make it less likely that there's going to be some large scale stimulus bill. But earlier today, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, he once again said Republicans are going to put forth this skinny deal. Uh, they say there is a narrow area where they have some bipartisan consensus with Democrats, particularly on what they can do for businesses and sending another round of stimulus checks, also some aid for schools. But the stuff Stumbling block to a broader deal is aid for state and local governments. Republicans say they do not want to bail out uh, those local leaders who have not been fiscally responsible in their words. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has been clear, Tanya, she will not go along with a narrow deal. She says all the issues on the table must be dealt with at once. She says if they if they come to an agreement on just a few of them, that she won't be able to get them back to the table to agree on all these other issues that are outstanding. But at this point, Tanya, it really doesn't appear that they've made a lot of progress so over the past several weeks that We've been reporting on this, and it just appears unlikely that there is going to be another large scale round of stimulus, certainly not before the election. All right. Well, Paula, as we just mentioned earlier as well, we're just eight weeks away from Election Day, mm -hmm. and you have reporting on the president's plan to release a list of potential Supreme Court nominees. Clearly, this is something being done with an eye toward the election, but tell mm -hmm. us why this is important to the president's supporters. That's right. I've spoken with several of the advisors who are helping the White House with this list. I'm told they've been working on it for quite some time, and it could be released as soon as this week. But the reason this list is significant, Tanya, these are the folks that the president is telling voters he would appoint to the Supreme Court if he got reelected and then got some vacancies, which we do expect there could be multiple seats opening up on the court over the next few years. And back in 2016, the president released a similar list, and that was a turning point for him, particularly when it came to evangelical voters. When the president put out a serious, well-vetted list of potential judicial nominees, it caused a lot of voters to take him more seriously, to give him a second look. And as I'm told by some advisors, uh, some pretty conservative voters were willing to hold their nose. Uh, this is a direct quote from one of the president's advisors and, and vote for the president, even if they had issues with his personal life or how he behaved in public. They realized that the president was serious about the courts, and that is a place where they can make a lot of inroads when it comes to socially conservative policies. Absolutely. So, Paula, who can we expect to see on this list of potential justices? Do you think there will be some repeats from his previous list? Well, here's what the goal is. I am told that with this list, what they want to do is they want to remind voters how many judges the president has already put on the federal bench. The president has appointed well over 200 federal judges, conservative judges who will likely serve 30, potentially even 40 years. So some of the names you're going to see on this list are folks the president has already appointed to some of these courts, particularly the appellate court. And they want voters to see, to be reminded of how many people the president has already appointed and that these are the folks. He's creating a pipeline that these are the folks that he could send to the high court. They also want to remind voters about the justices he has already put uh, in the high court. Obviously, Justices Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, who, who the president's supporters, for the most part, believe have done a very good job and delivered on this campaign promise the president made of stacking the courts with conservative judges. All right, sticking with the campaign, the New York Times reports the president's campaign has lost its significant cash advantage over Biden. What do we know about Mr. Trump's spending situation eight weeks out from Election Day? It's really interesting, Tanya. We know the Trump campaign and the RNC and the Joint Fundraising Committee, they've raised over a billion dollars since launching the president's reelection mm -hmm. bid. Um, but right now they've spent $850 million. Now, a short time ago, the campaign manager, Bill Steppi, and he spoke with, uh, with reporters, and he said that they are, quote, carefully managing uh, what is left in this budget. Now, he dismissed the idea uh, that they're hurting for cash, but it's clear following the departure of Brad Parscale in the role of campaign manager, the Trump campaign really is doing an assessment of how money has been spent and how it will be spent in the future. There were a lot of concerns and frustrations expressed by the president's allies that during Parscale's tenure that he was spending a lot on his, his digital campaign, even personal expenditures. So that's being evaluated very carefully. It's caused the campaign to rethink how they spend money. 
And a short time ago, as the president left for Florida, he said he would potentially be willing to put some of his own personal money uh, into the campaign if that's necessary. And Paula, the president is targeting Florida and North Carolina with campaign stops today. What's his message to those two important states? critically important states. Now, what's interesting in Florida, Tanya, is that while the president is there, he's really going to focus on an environmental message, which which was actually quite mm. surprising. Usually his stump speech focuses on trade, focuses on the economy. But here he's going to focus on his conservation and environmental protection efforts, particularly in the Everglades. Then he is going to head to North Carolina, and this is his sixth trip this year uh, to the state of North Carolina. And what's interesting there is one of the top officials in the county that he's going to visit uh, has said that they believe the president should follow the governor's order and wear a mask. He specifically advised the president, quote, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and when in North Carolina, do as the governor says. But we asked earlier today, we asked the chief of staff, Mark Meadows, will the president wear a mask? And it appears that he will not. His chief of staff said or reminded us that the president is the most tested man in America, uh, perhaps the world. And we infer from that that he will not be wearing a mask. But of course, testing uh, does not give you immunity to coronavirus. But that'll be something we'll be watching, uh, especially as Republicans on the ground there in that critical swing state are pushing the president uh, to use, use this measure that is even endorsed by his own government. All right, Paula Reed at the White House. Thank you so much. Health